The engine in the large two-seater truck hummed as it flew down the highway. The tall man behind the wheel glanced at the petite redhead cowering in the passenger seat. She rocked back and forth in obvious pain. Doc, could you stop for a bottle of water? I need to take two more Medol tablets. I'll go get some water, but Annie, you've already taken eight pills in the last two hours. Two more won't help. I can't believe you forgot your medicine. The woman exploded in anger. I did not forget these damn pills. I put them in my suitcase just before I closed it. Damn it, straight to hell. She suddenly stopped. I'm sorry. It is not your fault. You know I'm not angry with you, right? He patted her hand. I know. Yell at me if it helps. We'll be home in about 40 minutes. Just hang in there. She tried to smile. Sing for me, Doc. You know it calms me down. So the man she called Doc sang for her in a soft baritone. He sang love ballads, murder ballads, songs of cowboys, miners, fallen women, lovers, and outlaws until he turned into her driveway. His real name was Will Jones, not Doc Holliday. Her real name was Sherry Wilson, not Annie Oakley. She was married, but not to the man she called Doc. They were members of the Rough River Rangers, a Western reenactors club. They were from Rolla, a small town in the hills of Missouri. There were similar clubs in every state and in many foreign countries. People united for various reasons. Some because of nostalgia for simpler times. Others because of the spirit of adventure that those times represented. And others because of the costumes of the time and the communication of like-minded people. Some joined in the shooting, especially with black powder weapons. This is most suitable for a combination of all of these. Sherry became a member of the club at age 12 when her father joined them. He had always had a soft spot for antique weapons, but when he got married, he ordered his wife to lock them in a gun safe. She was from St. Louis, a nurse who had seen all too often what gunshot wounds can do to the human body. Unfortunately, when Sherry turned 10, her mother began to feel tired. She ignored it for a while, but eventually contacted her doctor. It was cancer. She lasted another year. Her father owned an insurance company with a network of offices throughout the state. Money was not his goal, but he threw himself into expanding his business. Sherry was given a babysitter and time to be alone. After six months, her father realized his mistake and began to repair the relationship. In fact, he never ignored her. He loved her dearly, but grief clouded his judgment. Joining Rangers provided him with the bonding experience he was looking for. One of his clients remembered his love for shooting. He was a local judge and board member. He invited them to the farm. The farm was the Rangers' headquarters, a real 140-acre farm, bequeathed by a founding member with the understanding that in the event of the club's dissolution, the land would go to charity. With a roster of over 100 members, the chances of this happening were slim indeed. Sherry will never forget her first visit. The farm was well-maintained, with well-kept pastures, fields, and woods. The farmhouse had a permanent caretaker who made sure everything was kept in order. He lived for free. He had a truck and a small salary. The focal point was the barn. Carefully refurbished over the years, it was now a replica of a western saloon that doubled as a meeting room. The bar was closed during meetings and in the presence of miners. Alcohol is served on Saturday nights and at adult events. Club members took turns tending the bar. Sherry and her father visited the farm on Saturday afternoon. They were given a tour of the barn and treated to frosty mugs of IBC root beer, of course. This was Missouri, after all. Petite all her life. At 12, she was only 140 centimeters. And sitting on a bar stool in a real western saloon with a mug in her hand, made a strong impression. When they went to the shooting range, everything, absolutely everything changed. One of the main activities of these clubs was shooting competitions. The top shooters will compete at districts, advance to sectionals, state regionals, and finally nationals. These were purely amateur competitions. No money changed hands except, perhaps for a gentleman's bet, only trophies and bragging rights. They visited the farm while training was underway for district meetings. Even with the obligatory earplugs, Sherry was impressed by how loud it was. The sight of black powder flames escaping from the barrels and smoke hanging in the air fascinated her. 
She stayed close to her father and the judge as they stopped occasionally to chat with the shooters. From time to time, one of the shooters would offer her father to shoot one of the weapons. He always readily agreed. They were discussing the merits of a particular rifle, a reproduction 50 caliber Hawken, when Sherry quietly stepped aside. After passing two stations, she saw him lying on a stand. The owner was sitting at a table facing the other way, disassembling and cleaning other weapons. He noticed her, but because of her small stature, he mistook her for a much younger child and put her out of his mind. She picked it up and, looking closely, realized what needed to be done. It was too heavy for her to hold with confidence in her small hands, so she placed the stock on a stand for better support and carefully aligned the barrel. The shooting stopped, otherwise the owner would never have heard the triple click of the cocked hammer. He turned around and was horrified to see a girl about eight years old holding his Colt Walker. Her face was only inches from his as she tried to take aim. Three things happened almost instantly. He shouted, No! She pulled the trigger. Walker's three kilogram, 44 caliber pistol jumped back. Her small arms weren't strong enough to hold him. He flew back, hitting her between the eyes. She fell down, stunned. She remembered the next few minutes bit by bit. Lots of shouting, mostly at her. A man talking to her, shining light into her eyes. And everywhere she looked, adults looked with angry eyes. They put her in a golf cart and took her back to the barn. As soon as she applied the ice pack to her rapidly swelling bruise, the lectures began. The judge came out first. Young lady, you have just committed the most serious rule violation possible on the range. You fired a weapon without permission into an area that had not been cleared. Thank God the goal setting was over. This is a weapon, my child. People could have died because of your carelessness. Besides, you suffered because of your carelessness. We were just lucky that one of our shooters today was an emergency physician. When the judge ran up, the owner of the colt flinched. Besides all this, touching another person's weapon without permission is a serious violation of etiquette. This is an act of complete disrespect that we do not take lightly. Her father intervened, apologizing and withdrawing his application for membership. Sherry cried bitterly and begged for forgiveness. Her pleas were so sincere and compassionate that she did not notice how smiles began to appear on their faces. The judge looked around the room. How about it, boys? Don't want to call a jury? Six people quickly sat down, four men and two women. The judge acted both as a prosecutor and as a judge in the case. Oddly enough, the man who owned the colt agreed to protect her. It was short and sweet. Do you admit your actions? The judge said sternly. She did this through sobs. Your witness, defense attorney. The man, who turned out to be their gunsmith and went by the name Sam Colt, began. Judge, members of the jury, Mistakes were made today. I should never have left a loaded weapon unattended. Judge, she was your guest and you should have kept a closer eye on her. This earned a frown from the judge. And you, young lady, should show more respect. I think that about sums it up. He looked straight at the jury. Be that as it may, I believe that she truly regrets and will not repeat her mistakes. He paused effectively. He then pulled the target out from under his vest. But most of all, we would be idiots to let a girl who had never fired any weapon before, without any training, go free and can still do it. He handed the target to the jury. It was the one she shot at. There was a hole in the exact center of the bull's eye. Even the judge was grinning. What do you say, jury? One of the women stood up after conferring with her companions. Your Honor, we find this girl guilty. She looked straight at Sherry, who lowered her head in tears. We ask that she and her father be offered membership in the club on the condition that she complete a gun safety course as soon as possible and, as punishment for her crime, be sentenced to two months of cleaning the shooting range and saloon. If you so wish, Your Honor, the judge stood up. Well said. You follow the Western tradition that the punishment should fit the crime. Stand up, young lady. She stood up. The jury has spoken, and I agree with one addition. Each member here has a name taken from a real person from the Old West. I'm a judge in real life, so I'm speaking on behalf of Roy Bean here. 
Sometimes it is chosen by a member of the board, sometimes by the board of governors. We have four board members here. With the approval of everyone here, I propose to immediately name you Annie Oakley, after the petite woman who was probably one of the best marksmen of either sex. What do you say, officers and club members? The walls of the saloon echoed with approval, and that's how the modern Annie Oakley appeared. For the next three weeks, Annie had to stay away from the shooting range while her father trained. She took the time to get to know the club members and their children. Every week before going home, she swept the salon and took out the trash. The sound of black powder guns drove her crazy, but she never complained. By the fourth week, she had a gun safety certificate and a set of five shot. Remington 31 caliber revolvers with nine centimeter barrels. Even with a third of the weight of the walkers, they were still almost too much for her to lift. But under the guidance of Sam Colt, she became an artist. They experimented with the charges and found that they were still effective at only two-thirds the normal charge of gunpowder. The reduced recoil helped tremendously. At age 13, she began participating in shooting competitions. She took third place at the regional competition. Six months later, she took first place and made it to state. At age 15, she won state and regional competitions and placed third at nationals. At 17, she won it all. Young national champion in pistol and rifle shooting in the black powder division, she gave up competitive shooting to concentrate on college, where she graduated with a degree in finance. She started out as an agent in one of her father's offices and worked her way up to manager. Freed from school, she resumed competitive shooting. She married a man whom her father did not trust or approve of. This almost takes us back to where we started. Will Jones appeared about three years before our story begins. He had a distant relative here who wanted to sell his dental practice for a good price. He knew the area and got a good deal, so he bought it when he and his wife arrived from Georgia six months after their wedding. Three months later, in the midst of one of the harshest winters in years, she decided that she liked the sunny South better than marriage. Luckily, he had a prenuptial agreement, and since he had been married for less than a year, it was dissolved. He met Sherry's father when his dentist retired and came to see him. They talked about guns and Will invited him to his home to show him his prized possession, a Confederate 36 Navy Colt made by Star Arms. His great-great-grandfather wore it in the war. Her father invited her to go out to meet the Rangers. He instantly bonded with the group. As it turned out, he was deathly in love with pistols. Being ambidextrous, he could shoot accurately from two pistols at once. Almost overnight, the trophy display began to expand. Since he's tall, thin, and a dentist from Georgia, only one name would suit him, Doc Holliday. When he met Annie, he was immediately attracted to her. When he saw her rings, he felt a strange sense of loss, but being a Southern gentleman, he treated her with respect. She felt the same way, but even if her marriage was a little rocky at times, she still kept her vows. Being the two best marksmen in the group, they were constantly together, and after the initial awkwardness, they developed a close friendship. When the Rangers traveled to competition, they traveled in style. The wealthier members took extreme pride in their trophies, going so far as to sponsor some of the top marksmen financially. One of the members was a truck driver and would deliver a custom stagecoach and three buggies to the state level and above whenever possible. Other members of the group transported horses in two-seater trucks like the one Doc owned. They made reservations at equestrian campsites and pitched tents, while those who preferred comfort stayed in hotels. On the day of the shooting, they were to meet and ride in style, with attendants leading the stagecoach and carriages in a procession designed to intimidate. It almost always worked. At the state level and above, it was a two-day event. Most of the rangers enjoyed it, and it gave them the opportunity to socialize informally with other groups. Will played mandolin, and there were several guitarists and fiddlers, so there were often jam sessions or impromptu dances. Annie stayed close to Doc during these meetings for safety reasons. The tent he and his father shared was almost always next to his tent. The particular meeting they were returning from was canceled due to rain. 
It was supposed to be just rain on Friday morning, but by midday it started to really rain. It continued throughout the night and was still going strong by Saturday morning. Black powder doesn't handle rain well. The host club canceled it and postponed it for two weeks. Everyone packed their things and left. This was a blessing for Annie. During her freshman year of college, she developed an acute attack of premenstrual syndrome. She tried to fight it, but it got so bad that she was almost expelled. Finally, the doctor found the right medication to balance her hormonal levels and mental state. Before taking the medication, the cramps were excruciating and, in her own words, she turned into a screaming bitch who hated everyone, including herself. She took her pills religiously and couldn't understand why they were missing from her suitcase. She also wouldn't be able to compete, she said, because she'd be shaking so much she wouldn't be able to hit anything, which was a good thing, because having a loaded gun in her hands right now wasn't a good thing. Idea. Her father was on the National Board of Directors, and since no one could compete, they decided to hold an impromptu planning meeting. On one hand, he was sad because he had finally met someone and wanted to go back to her house, and happy because he had experience with Annie without the pills, and the five-hour drive with her scared him. He took the easy way out and talked Doc into taking her home. And now we're back where we started. Thirty-eight minutes later, Doc backed into her driveway so they could unload her gear. Her house was old and partly built into the side of a hill. It was in excellent condition and she kept it clean, which was important given her husband's habits. The garage was also a basement. She got out of the car and slung the gun belt over her shoulder. Give me a minute, Doc. The garage door opener is on the visor of my car at my dad's house. I'll go through the side door and open it from the inside. Then I'll see where I left my pills. She was shaking almost uncontrollably. He was afraid that she might faint. I'll take a walk with you. Maybe you dropped your pills on the garage floor. She fiddled with her keys. He took them, used the one she pointed to, and led her inside. What the hell? Why is this girl's car in my garage? In its place was a painted Volkswagen convertible parked. Only one person in the city drives such a car. Lisa Gold, one of her agents. Before he could react, she was already outside the door and heading towards the master bedroom. He caught her at the open bedroom door. Luckily, she froze for a minute. He approached her just as she pulled out one of her pistols and pointed it at the bed. He didn't have time to pry the gun out of her hand, so he tried to put it down. His hand touched the hammer just as she pulled the trigger, and his thumb came between the firing pin and the primer. The firing pin cut his skin, but did not allow him to fire. Using his momentum and size, he lifted her and covered her mouth with his hand. She kicked his shins with her boots and tried to bite his hand, but he dragged her back into the basement. The couple on the bed didn't even notice them. Lisa was wearing Annie's favorite Stetson hat and her ostrich skin boots and nothing else. Jimmy stood behind her and held her while she screamed, Ride me, cowboy. Yes, ha. Huh? He let her struggle for a while. Annie, calm down. I'm not going to lose you by letting you kill them. It's not worth it. His words were barely perceptible, but she finally stopped. He removed his hand from her mouth and sat her down on the workbench where she kept her shooting supplies. He took her pistols and took out the cartridges. She sat and trembled. He touched her gently. Come on, I'll take you home with me. She blinked several times and began to shake her head. Not yet. I'm going to let these two idiots know that I know. He saw the rage boiling inside her. She looked around wildly, saw her pistols with missing cartridges, stopped and smiled, reaching for the cabinet behind his desk. She pulled out the extra cylinder and began installing it. Annie, I won't let you shoot them. She poured and packed gunpowder into cartridges, adding some rock salt that she had in the corner to clear the snow from the sidewalks. I'm not going to shoot at them. I'm not going to put bullets in, but I'm going to scare the crap out of them. She loaded four cartridges and installed the caps. Come on, be quiet. They quietly crept up the stairs. The lovers finished having sex and they could be heard talking. Darling, aren't you afraid that we might get caught? It won't be a big deal for me because I'm single. If you despise that little bitch, why do you stay with her? 
You keep telling me I'm better, and I do things she won't do. I never say no, and always come when you call. We've been having sex for almost a year, and she still doesn't know anything. Thanks to this stupid gun club and her belief that she's the reincarnation of fucking Annie Oakley, we've got a lot of time. Anyone who could inform us is with her now. He paused to grin with satisfaction. I bet she won't win this time. She pissed me off before she left with a list of urgent things to do, so I stole her fucking pills from her bag. Right now she's probably shaking like a leaf and tearing off some poor guy's new ass with one hand and tearing his head off with the other. And as much as I love this and this and this. They heard quiet signs. She has something you don't have. Pocket full of money. Oh, she doesn't have it yet, but her old man won't last forever, and when he's gone, she'll get the inheritance. We don't have a prenuptial agreement, so I automatically get half. Half is worth millions. I'll leave her ass, split 50-50, and you and I will go somewhere warm. Sounds like a good plan. Annie heard all she could bear. She burst through the door screaming, assholes, and fired. Black powder makes a loud sound, especially in a confined space. Couple that with smoke, flames, the sound of unburned gunpowder and rock salt hitting the wall, and anyone would be scared. Lisa and Jimmy cried and begged while Annie used all seven dirty words that George Carlin talked about in the most interesting ways. Finally, she stopped and cocked the gun. Shut the fuck up! Get both of your pathetic asses out of your bed and go down to the garage right damn it! And don't try to run or I'll shot you your pathetic manship. Annie led them to the basement. She refused to let them get dressed. She seemed distant. Open the garage door. They started complaining. It was cold. It was raining. It was still light. It was a mistake they both regretted. She walked up to Jimmy and put the gun to his groin. If you don't open this door by the time I count to three, I'm going to pull the trigger. There's no bullet in it. All it contains is a double dose of powder and about an ounce of rock salt. It probably won't kill you unless you bleed to death. But if you have any left at all, it will be useless. One. Davi. Oh. The garage door swung open. She smiled. Now I'm going to give you a chance. I'll count to five. When I count to five, I'll shoot you in the ass. If you run fast enough, the rain will just cover you in dust. If you hesitate or slip, the rock salt will dissolve in your ass within a week. Oh, and by the way... I'm filing for divorce. Now let's just see how well I hit the target without these stupid pills. He started apologizing that it was a mistake and he still loved her. She smiled. One. Pure terror gave him speed. He flew along the sidewalk while she counted. Two. Three. Four. Bang. His scream was unreal. It hit him right in the ass. Doc thought she might have underestimated the power of a double charge of gunpowder. She looked back and smiled at Lisa. Why don't you run away, bitch? One, two, subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.